The final question is, was Jesus temptable? Could Jesus Christ actually be tempted to sin? Now that's an answer, a question that I, that I answered flippantly back in, in my earlier days as a Christian, not understanding how, critically, how critical it really was. Could Jesus Christ be tempted to sin? On the one hand, you hope so, because, hey, I want him to understand me. I want to know that he knows what I'm feeling and what I'm struggling with, that he really does dial into to my nature to the point that he's experienced what I've experienced. On the other hand, that scares me a little bit because I don't want there to be any cracks in the foundation. i got to know that the Lord that I am trusting for my life, i got to know He's solid and secure. And if He can be tempted, and if He can actually sin, I, I know He didn't. And I'll tell you the end of the story before He begins. He doesn't, okay? I know He didn't sin, but the question is, could He sin? And if He could sin then there's some danger there. So we're going to get to that, but it's going to take us a few minutes before we come back to it. Let's, uh, let's read through this and then pray for the Lord's uh, clear guidance in our study. Matthew chapter 4, verse 1, Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be te- tempted by the devil. And after he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he then became hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3. Then the devil took him on into the holy city, that's Jerusalem, and had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you're the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it's written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus said to him, On the other hand, it's written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Deuteronomy 6.16 Again the devil took him to a very high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory, and he said to to him, All these things I will give you if you'll fall down and worship me. And Jesus said to him, Go, Satan, for it is written you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Deuteronomy 6.13 And then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and began to minister to him. Father, may we not miss the significance of what you're doing here. Father, may we not see this as another story in the life of Jesus, just an interesting tale, fanciful at best. May we not bypass this, but may we pause and understand what this is all about. And I pray, Father, for all of my brothers and sisters this morning, as well as for myself, that you will keep us alert in the flesh. And, Father, I pray that you will keep our minds uh, going in our soul. But, Lord, I pray you would lead us on to the place of the Spirit so we would have true understanding to the point of life change. And we know only your Holy Spirit can do this, so we ask for your Spirit to be here and to be our teacher. In Jesus' name, amen. Glucose is the primary fuel source of the body. It's essential for the brain to function, and you know what I'm talking about when you're driving down the road and you skipped lunch, and you're starting to veer, and, and you got that, that, sense, that horrible sense of just being exhausted. This happened to me yesterday. It's amazing. Just a taco at Taco Bell brings me kind of back to life. Yeah. <laughs> When our physical bodies are denied glucose for more than four to eight hours, the body turns to the liver for the stored form of glucose that's called glycogen. Be sure to note all of this. The body then converts glycogen into glucose to supply the needed fuel. At this point, the body will also use small amounts of protein to supplement this full miracle of evolution. (laughs) After 12 hours of this, if glucose is still not available, the body turns to muscle stores of glycogen, which usually lasts for a few more days. When the threat of muscular atrophy is felt, the body switches over to fat as the fuel source, converting it into ketones through catabolism, which means if you work out, first, you've got to work out and lose some muscle mass. Then, eventually, it'll switch over to dealing with the fat. <coughs> which is why I haven't been back to the gym, because it just takes too long. Okay? 
Ketones, while not actual sugars like glucose, are able to be used by the brain as a fuel source as long as glucose is denied. But there's a problem because toxins are stored within fat as protective biomechanisms. And during catabolism, these toxins are released into the bloodstream, increasing the possibility of acetaminophen poison. I didn't know you could be poisoned by acetaminophen, except if you're like three years old and you down the bottle. Acetaminophen poisoning. The body will keep using fat in this way until fat levels reach less than 2% and an internal hunger alarm goes off. When that happens, starvation occurs as the body turns to the vital organs for a fuel source and death is imminent. Why go into all this biology 101? Because that's where Jesus was at the beginning of the temptations. Biological research tells us something begins to happen to the body when a person fasts over a long period of time. First, first off, in the first 24 to 48 hours, if you've tried a short-term fast, some youth groups have done 30-hour famine trying to raise money for world vision. Maybe you've done a short fast, 24 to 48 hours, and during that time, you feel hunger. There's a great awareness of it. I can skip lunch, and I am <laughs> ready for dinner. You feel it in a very short amount of time, but, but I'm told if you're willing to fast beyond about the fifth day... Hunger goes away. Your body literally is not hungry anymore. You don't have the sensation of even needing to eat, if you can make it to that point. A person then usually won't even feel hungry again until around the 35th day to the 40th day. But at that point, the danger is death is imminent. Because in the moment that hunger starts to be felt again, you're on the verge of dying. And that's exactly where Jesus was. Look at verse 2. It says he fasted 40 days and 40 nights. He then became hungry. His body was getting ready to shut down. It was turning to vital organs for survival. He was in bad shape. And this is before the devil began to tempt him. We need to understand that sudden increase in hunger means that in his flesh he was at a, a massive weak point. Possibly the weakest point he'd ever been up to that point. It's not just when he left the heavens that he became fully human so he was like us. He became so fully human that to do without food crippled him. That out in the wilderness, he was at the point of starvation. And the mind gets fuzzy and the the will gets loose and, and you're not thinking about what you're doing and you're just in a place of exhaustion. That's where Jesus was. Absolutely humanly weak. But there's something else we need to understand before we get into the story of the temptation of Jesus. This was the Father's will. This is what God wanted for Jesus. Verse 1, Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Mark tells us in chapter 1, verse 12, immediately the Spirit impelled him or drove him out into the wilderness. Luke chapter 4, verses 1 and 2 says, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led around by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by the devil. This is a vital moment in the life of Jesus Christ before his ministry began because it clearly portrays the battle, the struggle, the epic ordeal between flesh and spirit. Now remember, before this happened, Jesus had just been baptized. And for you and me, baptism, as we talked about last week, it symbolizes the death of the natural man and the birth of the spiritual man. Once we are born into Jesus, born again, born to new life, The wonder is that the Holy Spirit now resides in us. Same Holy Spirit that resided in Jesus. The same Spirit of Christ. Romans 6.10 tells us, For the death that He died, He died to sin once for all. But the life that He lives, He lives to God. Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. So here in the temptation of Jesus, we see the contrast played out. Satan appeals to the natural man. Jesus responds, as the spiritual man. Verse 2 going on tells us he then became hungry and the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. That word if, gang, is in the subjective form. All that means is he's assuming him to be the Son of God. In other words, Satan knows Jesus is the Son of God. He's not tempting him to find out. When he says, If you are the Son of God, it's in essence saying, Since you are the Son of God, turn these stones into bread. In other words, Satan knew who Jesus was. James 2.19 tells us the demons also believe and shudder. They know who the person of Jesus is. Satan had no question, no doubt, when he came to him in that wilderness setting. But Satan is saying, and listen to this, he's saying, since you're the son, 
You've got the power. Make some bread and satisfy your hunger. Feed your appetite. And we head into standard attack formation number one for Satan. Feed the flesh. Now he will do this with us. You might want to take note of these three temptations and what he, what's going on here. What he's actually using against Jesus. For he uses it against you and against me. Number one, feed the flesh. What's interesting is this is a common temptation, especially for those who are aware of their spiritual giftedness. What do you mean? Using spiritual power to feed fleshly appetite. This is why you've seen great evangelists and healers and revivalists fall flat on their faces, because Satan would tempt them to use spiritual power to feed the flesh. To care for or to to go into fleshly appetites. This is why I pointed out over and over... That there are two specific reasons, there's a twofold purpose that God gives us spiritual gifts. And it is not to feed our flesh, and it is not for the experience or the exaltation or the excitement. The Lord gives us the spiritual gifts to witness for Christ and to serve in the body of Christ. And that's it. Power to speak the name of Jesus, to be an evangelist in your world, wherever you may be. And power to serve and minister to the body of Christ. That's why we're given the gifts. Spiritual giftedness is not for fleshly application. That's why Paul says in Romans 13, 14, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh. And that verse should challenge every one of us to the core. Make no provision for the flesh. What does that mean? We talked about it in depth on Wednesday night, but simply, it means make no provision for the flesh. (laughs) Stop doing things that feed the flesh. Don't even open the door a crack. Make no provision for the flesh. Well, in verse 4, Jesus responds. He answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Quoting Deuteronomy to the devil, Jesus turns the focus from his own very real, incredible appetite and hunger to his Father's greater will. It was God's will at that time for Jesus to be hungry. God's will for Jesus to be in the wilderness. God's will for Jesus to be suffering. That might bother some of you because we stop and say, wait a minute. You're saying that God wanted Jesus to suffer? Hebrews chapter 5 verse 8 says, although he was a son, he learned obedience from the things which he suffered. Okay, hang on a second. He learned obedience? Now I got another problem going off in my mind. You're going to come across a lot of problems this morning. Things that just kind of stir up the, the, the spirit in us. And we're trying to understand these things. Jesus learned obedience. Oh, wait a minute, wasn't he God? God learns? I, I, I don't know how I feel about that. Just remember this. When Jesus became human, he emptied himself of godly power and glory. It's not that he didn't know how, know how to obey. He understood obedience in the way that we do in the flesh. He learned, he experienced the process of obedience in his human nature, just like us. But there's another implication that makes many of us squirm. If it was God's will for Jesus to suffer, might it be his will for me to suffer? Might he be calling me into a place of pain, difficulty, and hardship? We ascribe those things to Satan, but you know what? Oftentimes, they are the Lord. Yes, Satan was here tempting Jesus, but it was the Lord who sent Jesus out there. It was the Spirit who led Jesus, not just out into the wilderness. Oh, no, Satan's here. He led him into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. It was the purpose of God that Jesus go through this, that Jesus may be in a place of suffering. And if it's God's will that Jesus might suffer... It may be his will that you suffer as well. 1 Peter 5, verse 9. Resist the devil firm in your faith, knowing that the same experiences of suffering are being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world, as Les just pointed out earlier. 800 homes of Christian brothers and sisters, our brothers and sisters, destroyed. People being martyred in countless numbers today for their faith in Jesus Christ that we share. This should bring tears to our eyes. This is a reality in the world. And Peter draws our attention to it. These experiences of suffering. Man, if you're going through hard times, understand. Same thing's happening by your brethren who are in the world. And then Peter says, but after you've suffered for a little while, the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. And we look at Jesus here in his physical suffering. And how does he respond? He says, man, it is better to be filled up with God's word than to fulfill the appetite of my flesh. 
I would rather have the word in my heart than have food in my stomach. Because our greatest resource against the temptations of the enemy, not to mention against the lustful appetite of the flesh, is the word of God. It's why we are so bent on studying and being in God's word here. Psalm 119.11, your word I have treasured in my heart, that I may not sin against you. Those of you who are struggling with sin in your life, go back to the word. The more you're in the word, the more resource you have to fight against sin. 1 John 2.14, John, I, I like this verse. He said, I've written to you young men because you're strong. And the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the evil one. How do they overcome the evil one? The word of God abides in them. You've got them in your heart. You've got the word in your heart. You have tools with which to fight. You've got a sword that you can use. Now, as I look at this, I wonder what stone bread would have tasted like had Jesus made it. I think about these things from time to time. <laughs> because Jesus didn't turn the stones into bread, though, he ended up with something far better. He got angel food cake. Look at the end. It says, <laughs> verse 11, that the devil left him and angels came and began to minister to him. So far better. <laughs> far more tasty. But, but I actually am making a point with this, gang. <laughs> Don't settle by doing things in your own energy in the flesh because you just lose and use up valuable glucose. Instead, wait for the Father's perfect timing and when it's right, He will measure out to you all the energy you need. If you do it His way. We do it our way and we burn it up. Jesus could have made stones into bread right then and eaten it and gotten a little bit of energy there to the expense of sin and falling to the temptation of Satan. Verse 5, the devil then took him into the holy city and had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple. A lot of experts believe this was not actually on top of the temple, but it was on the temple mount, probably the southwest corner of the temple mount, because from that point, if you look down, there's about a 200-foot sheer drop. And Jesus and Satan, you can even imagine being on that corner and looking down at the, at the Jerusalemites milling about down below, hundreds of people down there. Watch what Satan does. He takes him to this place, verse 6, and said to him, If you're the Son of God, so I know you are, throw yourself down. For it's written, He will command His angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Satan is tying into a commonly held belief among Jewish people in the day that Messiah would appear and come immediately down to the temple. Malachi 3.1, Behold, I am going to send my messenger, and he will clear the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. So they're looking for this. Psalm 24.7, Lift up your heads, O gates. Be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. And there were other prophecies that indicated when he came, he was going to come to the temple. Second coming prophecies. But the people really were hungering and waiting. I mean, there was, there was a, sen- a sense of Messiah's coming. Kind of a Messiah hunger at this point in Israel. And Satan has thrown out this this actually pretty well thought out temptation. Satisfy the soul. Number one was feed the flesh. Number two, Satan wants to use popular opinion. Satisfy the soul. What do you mean by the soul? The soul gang is the seat of thought, emotion, intellect, and wisdom, human wisdom. It's where we do our working things out. It's where we're thinking things through. It's the wisdom of man. And here, prior to the launch of Jesus' public ministry, Satan appeals to the soul man of Jesus. He appeals to the wisdom of man. Advertise. (laughs) Go public in a big way. Jump off the temple. God will bear you up. People will see it happen, and they'll be amazed. And you can save so much time if you'll just do this now. How fantastic would that be? Can you imagine the popularity Jesus could have immediately gotten among the people in Jerusalem and were getting out to the surrounding area if he leapt off the temple and floated down to the ground? (laughs) A marvelous feat. I mean, come on, who among us has not wished they could fly at some point in your life? (laughs) That was an elementary school dream of mine. I would lie there at night, just, you know, before I fell asleep, just thinking, that would be so cool if I could get up in the morning and fly to school. And all my friends would be on the playground, you know, I'd do a couple of loops, and then I'd come down and say, who wants rides, you know? <laughs> and I'd be so popular. And this is what Satan is appealing to. Jesus, if you do this, you're going to get some cool response. People will be amazed. They'll be impressed. It's the whole impetus of American Idol. 
get up on stage. Why is it that thousands of people show up for these tryouts all over America? Most of them can't sing an inch. They can't sing at all. (laughs) And they get up there for that moment of glory. Man, if I could just stand on the praise and have the adulation and the adoration of, of hundreds of thousands of people, wouldn't that be great? Wouldn't that be soul satisfying? That was my temptation before my family moved up here. Because I'm thinking, okay, I'm getting out of youth ministry and it's time for me to start really working with adults and teaching the word. And our senior pastor at the church I was working at, 2,500 member church, our senior pastor, retired. Who better for the job but me? I'm the man. I put my name in the hat. I talked to the elders about it. I'm like, guys, you know, we had a pretty cool youth ministry going on. I can step up. I got it. And in my soul, I'm thinking, logically, I'm working out how much better to teach the Word to 2,500 people than to go start a church or start somewhere smaller. I mean, I'm here now, Lord. Use me. I'm ready to teach. And so God brought me up here to a church of about 25 people. <laughs> And it busted my soul, man, wide open. That was some serious ego bruising. I can tell you more about that another time. We're not going to right now because it hurts. <laughs> I tell you that to say this. The church, the church most often resides, I'm afraid, in the soul. Not in the flesh. I mean, the flesh definitely gets all of us, and, and we have, have that tendency toward the physical appetite. But the soul is the thinking person, and that's where so much of our time is spent. Working it out. Figuring out how do we get people in the door. What do we need to do to to jump off the pinnacle of the temple so that all the people in the surrounding region will go, that's the church I want to be involved in. And it's soul thinking. There's another level that's much better. And that's the spirit. But I'm getting a bit ahead of myself here. The problem with this whole idea of, of residing in the soul, where our plans are good and our intentions are spot on, and big programs are happening to get it done. The problem is, where is the faith? Where is the faith? And if my budget can cover it, why do I have to trust God for it? A spectacular leap from the temple, followed by a fantastic mid-air pause, then suspended on angels' wings, was not the way of trust. And Ironside said this was in no way part of the holy ways of the Son of God. This would have been a presumptuous use of the promise. By the way, Bible students, you probably recognize that Satan misquotes Scripture here. It's Psalm 91, verses 11 and 12. Satan says, He'll command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they'll bear you up so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Right in the middle, and Matthew kind of points it out because he divides the Scripture. Right in the middle, he leaves out to guard you in all your ways. Listen again. He will command his angels concerning you, Psalm 91, 11, to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. Why would Satan leave that out? Because the entire psalm of Psalm 91 was about the way of walking in trust. And to jump off the temple was not about trust. It was violating faith. Be careful. Satan does this all the time. He loves to get in there and pervert the word of God. He will do it through friends of yours who say, Ah, doesn't the Bible say such and such and so and so? And you walk away going, Oh man, does it? Does it say that? You go back and try and look it up and you can't find it and you're asking for concordances and it's freaking you out. Will you just trust me when I tell you that the Bible stands, that it is always true and it does not contradict itself and it is not a flimsy work. This is the living, breathing, active Word of God. So you can at least start there. And then we'll find the verses together. So Jesus' response reveals a wisdom that is greater than that of the soul. Greater than the typical mentality of man. He compares Scripture to Scripture. Which is what I ask you to do with open Bibles every week. Compare Scripture to Scripture. Follow along. Make sure that what I'm saying is what it's saying. Because if it's not, what I'm saying has no value. Make sure it's what the Word says. Jesus responds in verse 7. He says, On the other hand, it's written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Why? Because trust doesn't experiment with providence. Let me say that again. Trust doesn't experiment with providence. And we do that sometimes. Okay, Lord. You want me to sign up for children's ministry? Make the light turn red now! (laughs) Yes, I'm not called to children's. And we play these little mind games. If you do this, Lord, I'll know that you're telling me to do that. 
Well, trust doesn't experiment with providence. Faith is not looking for the fantastic. Faith is entrusting yourself to God's will and purposes, whether it makes sense to you or not. When the Lord says to do it, you do it because He says to do it, not because it makes sense. Now, I promise you, it will make sense, maybe not immediately. You're going to listen to me or the cow? Your choice. Okay? <laughs> Test everything against the whole council of Scripture. See, this is the best Satan can do this morning. (laughs) Interrupt him. Make noise. (laughs) He doesn't want you to hear this. Verse 8. Verse 8 going on. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give you. And by the way, Jesus doesn't dispute that. Because these things are the devil's to give. Ever since he usurped authority in the Garden of Eden from Adam and Eve, he gained control of the kingdoms of the world. All this stuff I'll give you if you'll fall down and worship me. And Jesus said to him, Go, Satan, for it's written, You shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. All the kingdoms of the world at his hands. And he says, Look, here's the deal. I'll give it to you now. And don't miss this. Satan was not appealing to the flesh. He was not trying to satisfy the soul. He now attacks the core of who Jesus is and why Jesus came to this world. Number three, satiate the spirit. Now Satan is going after who Jesus is. Look, look, the deceiver is saying, you're supposed to receive the kingdom anyway. You came to be the king. This is just a shortcut. I'll give it to you now. Take it today. All you got to do is, you know, worship me just for a second. I won't even make it a long, protracted worship. So you get bored and want to leave and go to lunch or something. I will just make it quick. I can give it all to you, Satan is saying, without the cross. You have it now. Be who you were meant to be. Satiate the Spirit. Just do it the easy way. See, I don't believe Satan is telling you not to be spiritual. I'm saying, I think he's telling us to be spiritual his way. To be spiritual quickly. Not to take the time that's necessary to grow into, to suffer through, and to come to the point where God is maturing us in our faith. No, let's do it right now. Let's jump on it today. So many potentially great Christian leaders have been sidelined by shortcuts rather than walking the path of suffering, which produces the character that's needed to lead. And I've had these conversations, and I've thought these thoughts myself, where you think, I just wish I was there right now. And God would say, yeah, but it's going to be so much better out there. Walk with me for a while. Boy, I I was reading uh, just this morning from my utmost for his highest. And there was one phrase he said that just blew my mind. He said, walk with Jesus until there is no appearance of footsteps in front of you anymore. In other words, you don't see his footsteps because you are in them. That's, That's taking the time to be the people he's called you to be, the children that He wants us to be. God can satisfy the Spirit like no one else can. And again, listen to me. To satisfy the Spirit with anything other than the Spirit of God Himself is tantamount to devil worship. Which is why Jesus responds, You shall worship the Lord your God and serve Him only. Because if I'm trying to find my spiritual satisfaction in what I'm doing, if I stand up before you and say, I'm a teacher of the Word. And that's, that's who I am then I have missed it. Because that is not who I am. Who I am is a son of the king. You don't say, I'm a great worshiper. That's who I am. No, you're not. That is not who you are. Who you are is a daughter of the king. The spirit in me is what I'm looking for. Not my spirituality but his Holy Spirit in me. That is a true satisfaction. That's what we're looking for. So Jesus says, serve the Lord and worship Him only and nothing else. Don't even worship the things that you use to worship the Lord. You worship Him. Because the Creator is the only one who can satiate our spirits. The only one who can satisfy the soul. He's the only one who can feed the flesh in a positive and correct and godly way. Did you know it's okay to feed the flesh God's way? To eat P.F. Chang's China Bistro God's way? (laughs) That's good. You come out of an experience of eating at a restaurant like that. I'm just using that as a, as a lame example. But, but if you eat it and you're just like, this is, I mean, wow. 
My taste buds are going nuts. Last night we were, we were down and went to P.F. Chang's, and then we went over to the, to the mall down there in Linwood, and we went into the Yankee Candle Store. I love that place. <laughs> we spent like an hour, two hours, smelling candles. Not two hours, but about a, about a half an hour, we're in there going, oh, you got to smell this. Smell this out. Oh, this one's been, you know, the autumn spice and all that. Oh, my nose, I, okay, I, I imbibed a little bit. My nose was drunk on the smells. I mean, it was just incredible. <laughs> Amazing. Of course, then Rod came up with a great idea to come up with some man sense. You know, tired old t-shirt, you know, something like that. Anyway, where am I? <laughs> So all this happened in verse 11. The devil left him, and behold, angels became, and and they began to minister to him, which by the way, in and of itself, is a humility. That the creator of the universe, the creator of the angels, now is in such a weakened state that he has to have their help. That he needs nurturing just to survive. It's amazing. This will happen again. It'll happen in the Garden of Gethsemane where once again Jesus is to the point of death and the only way to make it the next few hours to the cross was for the angels to come and minister to him and give him just enough glucose, just enough energy to fulfill the mission. Amazing. Jesus was uh, before Pilate. And in verse 37 of John 18, Pilate said to him, So you are a king? And Jesus answered, Listen, you say correctly, I am a king. For this I have been born. For this reason I have come into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who's here who is of the truth hears my voice. I came to be a king. But Jesus refused to put the crown before the cross. The cross had to come first. The cross mattered more than the crown. It was only by going through the cross that he would receive the crown. And by the way, within minutes of talking to Pilate and declaring the fact that he came into the world for the purpose of being king, a crown was placed on his head, a crown of thorns. Because Jesus would not take the crown without the cross. Now quickly, I want to recognize something in all of this. The pattern of temptation, this feeding the flesh... And then trying to satisfy the soul and satiate the spirit. These three areas are the way that Satan works. His playbook gang is very thin. He uses them over and over and over throughout history and in every single one of our lives. Watch this. Go back to the first time we ever saw a temptation. Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3. In verse 1. We read the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. By the way, we know the serpent is Satan. The Bible is very clear about that. And he said to the woman, Indeed, has God said you shall not eat from any tree of the garden? Temptation number one, Eve, are you hungry? Feed the flesh. Feed the flesh. Turn the stones into bread, Jesus. Eve, how's the fruit looking? He appeals to the fleshly appetite. Verse 2. The woman said to the serpent, From the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat, but from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said you shall not eat from it or touch it. Well, God didn't say that. He said don't eat from it. He didn't say they couldn't touch it. Eve added that one. She says, Don't eat from it or touch it. He said, For you will die. Watch this. The serpent said to the woman, You surely will not die. Temptation number two. Think it out. Satisfy the soul. Come on, Eve. God won't hurt you. He created you. It's not going to hurt you. You think God actually put something in this garden to make life hard for you? To make you suffer? To cause you to die? God would think about it. Work it out, Eve. And you, you can almost see her there. He's going, yeah, would God do that? And she's in the soul. Well, God, he, yeah, no, he wouldn't do that. Satan goes on. Verse 5. For God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God. Satiate your spirit. Number three, don't you long to be spiritual like God? Now, a lot of us guys, we tend to vacillate back and forth between flesh and soul. That's where we're comfortable. That's our happy place, you know. We can both think through things and burp at the same time, so flesh, spirit, and soul, it's a good place to be, okay? Ladies... 
have this tendency toward the spiritual things. And that's great. But it's also very dangerous because all Satan is saying to Eve is, don't you long to be spiritual? I can help you be more spiritual. You want to be like God? You want to be godly? Here's how you do it. Satiate your spirit. Feed your spirit. And you will be like God. In the very first temptation, in the pages of Scripture, we see the exact same playbook used as Satan used against Jesus and as he will use time and time again. These same three attacks will be pulled out against you and me. Be aware of them, brothers and sisters. 1 John 2.15 John said, Do not love the things of the world, nor do not love the world, nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, be it the flesh, temptation number one, the lust of the eyes, temptation number two, uh, satisfy the soul, and the boastful pride of life, temptation number three, satiate the spirit, is not from the Father. These things are from the world. The world is passing away and also its lust, but the one who does the will of God lives forever. We are created as a trinity of sorts. We are created in the image of our Father, in the image of God. And we have flesh, and we have soul, and we have spirit. We have the physical man, and then we have the soul man, the, the thinking intellect, and then we've got the spiritual man, or woman, for some of you. And in this trinity, Satan wants to attack at every, at every level. And he will sometimes do it all at the same time, or sometimes he'll just go after one aspect, depending on where you're spending your time. I invite you, the Lord invites all of us, to spend our time in the realm of the spirit. With prayer and the word is our defense. That's the place where he calls us to reside, trusting in him completely. Here's the good news. Even though Satan wants to attack at all these levels, God wants to redeem us at all three levels as well. To redeem the flesh, to redeem the soul, to redeem the spirit. Now, all these temptations of Jesus beg a difficult question, which I promise to answer. Was Jesus capable of being tempted? And if so, could he have actually chosen in his flesh to sin? Let's consider that before we leave this morning. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 18. Hebrews 2, 18. Tells us, since he himself was tempted in that which he has suffered, he is able to come to the aid of those who are tempted. And I like that. Good. Okay. He's able to come to my aid because he was tempted like me, so he understands what it's like to be me. And so I've got a great relationship with Jesus. He's my bud. He's my man. He's my friend. He gets me. But again, I want to know I've got someone who can stand up for me. If I'm at the top of a burning building, I don't want some flimsy little girl carrying me down the ladder. No offense, ladies. I want a guy who's bigger. I want Chris Beyer. <laughs> I'm just putting in my request right now. If I'm ever at the top of a burning building in this area, Chris, you're my man, okay? I need a strong guy who's bigger than me, who's more well-trained than me, who can put me on his shoulders and take me down. Not someone who, as we're going down the ladder, is like, wow, you're heavy, dude. You know, I want... I want strength beneath me. I want, with my God, a God who is perfect. So that I know when I lean into him, I am not falling down. So I know no matter how the winds of of life blow, no matter how bad things get, I've got a foundation that is absolutely sure. No cracks anywhere. But if Jesus was tempted, there might be a crack. And that unnerves me. Well, let's be clear. There are no cracks in the foundation of Jesus Christ. Luke 1.35, the angel said to Mary, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you, and for that reason the Holy Child shall be called the Son of God. From the moment of conception, the person of Jesus Christ, both man and God, at the same time, was absolutely, flawlessly sinless. The Holy Child. John 14.13, I like this, Jesus said, The ruler of this world is coming, and he has nothing in me. He's got nothing on me. Jesus appealing to that perfection. Peter said in 1 Peter 2, 22, Jesus committed no sin. We could stop right there. 
Jesus committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. 1 John chapter 3, verse 5. He appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. Let me be absolutely clear so no one misses this. Jesus was perfect and perfectly incapable of committing a sin. But doesn't that make the whole temptation of Jesus Christ meaningless? Just a game? A show? I mean, if he couldn't really sin, then what's the whole point of this thing? Why does God have it in three of the four Gospels? And why are we led to to look at this? Is God just playing with us? I said Jesus couldn't sin. I did not say he couldn't be tempted. Now listen carefully here. The word sin has two meanings. Or not sin, sorry. The, let me be, back that up. The word temptation has two meanings to it. Temptation does not immediately imply an inclination to sin. You can be tempted yet without sin. The word tempt, both in the Hebrew, the Hebrew word is nasa, and the Greek word is parazo. Both the Hebrew and the Greek word That word temptation is used in two separate ways. And the first way is to entice. And that's Satan's intention. That's how Satan uses temptation. When Satan showed up there in the wilderness, his intent was to entice, to lure, to draw Jesus into sin. So from Satan's perspective, he's trying to tempt Jesus in this way. But James said, let no one say when he is tempted, parazzo, I'm being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil. Is Jesus God? I think we've established that truth. And if you're not sure about that, talk to me afterwards. God cannot be tempted by evil. In other words, he cannot be enticed. He cannot be lured. And James says he himself does not tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he's carried away and enticed by his own lust. And lust, when it's conceived, gives birth to sin. Sin is accomplished and it brings forth death. But there's another meaning to the word tempt that is being used even right here when Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted, parazzo, by the devil. To entice or to prove. The word means to prove and that's God's intention. Why would Jesus go through the tempting if he himself could not be tempted to sin? To prove him. To prove his righteousness. What, to God? No. To Jesus himself? No. To prove his righteousness to us. That we might see and know this foundation is absolutely solid. 1 Peter 1.6, Peter writes, And this you greatly rejoice. Even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials. Parazzo. Various provings. This was a trial of Jesus, a proving, a testing, to show us how strong he truly is. Peter says, so that the proof of your faith being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Satan tempts, God proves. Satan tempts, God proves. Satan went after Jesus with the desire to tempt him to sin. God, knowing Jesus was not going to sin, sent him into the temptation to prove, once and for all, for us, Jesus' righteousness. Again, he wasn't proving it to himself. Do you remember what happened right before the temptation? Verse 17, God cries out, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Now, if I were writing the Bible, I'd be glad I'm not, didn't. Or if I were God, be even more glad about that than I'm not. I would have said that after the temptations of Jesus. I would have said, now, check him out. My sinless son. See, he proved it to all of us. Woo, I'm pleased. But he says it before because God knew the innate character of Jesus was perfect righteousness. He didn't need to see it. He knew it. He had complete confidence in Jesus to fulfill his commission. So why again did the Spirit of God drive Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted so we could have confidence as well? This is just mind-boggling to me. The temptation of Jesus does two things. It proves his righteousness to us. proves that he has a foundation solid to stand upon. It also proves that he does understand us. He has gone through the things that we've gone through. He knows what it's like to be there. Yet, Without sin. So that when we read 2 Corinthians 5.21, it should blow our minds. He made him who knew no sin 
to be sent on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. And suddenly I get it. The temptation of Christ is all about the cross. Early, before He even starts His public ministry, Jesus goes to this time of proving. Proving His veracity. Proving His righteousness. His perfection. And we see that proving. Then He goes into His ministry and then He goes to the cross. And we don't stand there at the cross going, Oh man, I hope He pulls it out. I hope He does it. Oh, I hope He hangs on. We look at Jesus at the cross and we say, He did it. I knew He was going to do it. He did everything needed to save me. And by the way, when you know that a perfectly righteous Jesus died on the cross for you, then you can know your sins were perfectly dealt with once and for all. You don't have to live back there in that place that says, "Ah, I just hope God really forgave me. Is Jesus perfect or not? If He's perfect, then your sins are perfectly forgiven. And so Hebrews 4.16 tells us, Therefore let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. The temptation of Jesus Christ is all about the full sufficiency of Jesus to save us. Let's pray about that. Lord Jesus, I rest today and the knowing that you are perfectly righteous and true. You are flawless. We worship and honor you as such. And it's so sweet to know, God, that by putting on flesh and going through all this stuff, you do get us. That you do understand. We needed both and you gave us both. And we praise you for it. And as we pray this morning, Lord, I know there are people here who, who need to get out of the flesh and give their lives to You and make a decision and move on from that place into the place where Your Holy Spirit invades and dwells in their lives. And so, Father, I ask You to call us to You this morning. And as we pray, if you feel called, if you feel like Jesus is leading you to to Himself and wants you to be perfected and changed and matured and grown and loved and forgiven, I invite you to pray with me these words in your heart to the Father. I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And I know that I'm a sinner. And Jesus, I need your forgiveness. I need your understanding. And I need your strength. I pray to you this morning and declare you as the Lord of my life and as the King everlasting. And I ask your Spirit to come to me now and teach me what I need to know to walk with you forever. In Jesus' name, Amen. Let's stand together.